Part 4 Emily, feeling as if she had died and come back to life, got herself out of the disappointed house somehow and locked the door. The clouds had cleared away, and the world was dim and unreal in starlight. Hardly realizing what she was doing, she turned her face seaward, through the spruce wood, down the long windy pasture field, over the dunes to the sand shore, along it like a haunted driven creature in a weird uncanny half-lit kingdom. The sea afar out was like gray satin, half hidden in a creeping fog. But it washed against the sands as she passed in little swishing, mocking ripples. She was shut in between the misty sea and the high dark sand dunes. If she could only go on so forever, never have to turn back and confront the unanswerable question the night had put to her. She knew, beyond any doubt or cavil or mockery, that she had seen Teddy, had saved or tried to save him from some unknown peril. And she knew, just as simply and just as surely, that she loved him, had always loved him, with a love that lay at the very foundation of her being. And in two months' time, she was to be married to Dean Priest. What could she do? To marry him now was unthinkable. She could not live such a lie. But to break his heart, snatch from him all the happiness possible to his thwarted life, That, too, was unthinkable. Yes, as Ilsa had said, it was a very devilish thing to be a woman. Particularly, said Emily, filled with bitter self-contempt. A woman who seemingly doesn't know her own mind for a month at a time. I was so sure last summer that Teddy no longer meant anything to me so sure that I really cared enough for Dean to marry him. And now, tonight, and that horrible power or gift or curse coming again when I thought I had outgrown it, left it behind forever. Emily walked on that eerie sand shore half the night and slipped guiltily and stealthily into New Moon in the wee smas to fling herself on her bed and fall at last into the absolute slumber of exhaustion. Part 5 A very ghastly time followed. Fortunately, Dean was away, having gone to Montreal on business. It was during his absence that the world was horrified by the tragedy of the Flavian's fatal collision with an iceberg. The headlines struck Emily in the face like a blow. Teddy was to have sailed on the Flavian. Had he? Had he? Who could tell her? Perhaps his mother, his queer solitary mother, who hated her with a hatred that Emily always felt like a tangible thing between them. Hitherto, Emily would have shrunk unspeakably from seeking Mrs. Kent. Now nothing mattered, except finding out if Teddy were on the Flavian. She hurried to the tansy patch. Mrs. Kent came to the door, unaltered in all the years since Emily had first known her, frail, furtive, with her bitter mouth and that disfiguring red scar across her paleness. Her face changed, as it always did when she saw Emily hostility and fear contended in her dark, melancholy eyes. Did Teddy sail on the Flavian? demanded Emily, without circumlocution. Mrs. Kent smiled, an unfriendly little smile. Does it matter to you? 
she said. Yes, Emily was very blunt. The Murray look was on her face, the look few people could encounter undefeatedly. If you know, tell me. Mrs. Kent told her, unwillingly, hating her, shaking like a little dead leaf quivering with a semblance of life in a cruel wind. He did not. I had a cable from him today. At the last moment, he was prevented from sailing. Thank you. Emily turned away, but not before Mrs. Kent had seen the joy and triumph that had leaped into her shadowy eyes. She sprang forward and caught Emily's arm. It is nothing to you, she cried wildly. Nothing to you, whether he is safe or not. You are going to marry another man. How dare you come here, demanding to know of my son, as if you had a right. Emily looked down at her, pityingly, understandingly. This poor creature, whose jealousy, coiled in her soul like a snake, had made life a veil of torment for her. No right, perhaps, except the right of loving him, she said. Mrs. Kent struck her hands together wildly. You, you dare to say that, you who are going to marry another man. I am not going to marry another man, Emily found herself saying. It was quite true. For days, she had not known what to do. Now, quite unmistakably, she knew what she must do. Dreadful as it would be, still something that must be done. Everything was suddenly clear and bitter and inevitable before her. I cannot marry another man, Mrs. Kent, because I love Teddy, but he does not love me. I know that quite well, so you need not hate me any longer. She turned and went swiftly away from the tansy patch. Where was her pride, she wondered, the pride of the proud Murrays, that she could so calmly acknowledge an unsought, unwanted love? But pride, just then, had no place in her. <laughs>